Good evening, everyone. Hope all of you are staying safe during these pandemic times. Welcome to this session on creative writing by Mr. Abhinandan Bhattacharya. Mr. Abhinandan is an avid reader and believes that reading can bring about a holistic change in the way we look at things and interpret all that is happening around us. He is a published poet with about four publications to his credit. Currently, he is also compiling and editing an anthology dedicated to our mothers. He is a public speaker, having spoken on artificial intelligence and its impact on education at the 15th World Education Summit held in Mumbai last November. He was also invited as a speaker by the Senate House University of London in July 2019, where he shared his views on best practices in teaching the 21st century learners and has won laurels for his school. He loves animals and has a penchant for soft music, especially the old classics. So it's a pleasure to have you here and it, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Vidya. Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to uh, start off with the second series and the se uh, second part of the two part series of creative writing. Narrative writing is something which uh, is uh, asked at school for all our learners at IGCSE. There are 40 marks for it. However, uh, thanks to all the participants from the descriptive writing uh, webinar, and I'm really uh, pleasantly surprised and so happy you know, to take this forward. And let me tell you something, let me sh share one interesting piece of news with all of you. At the end of the descriptive writing webinar, I had uh, suggested and I had shared one kind of you know, assignment. You won't believe they were not 25, they were not 30, they were not 40, but there were 50 participants, 50 teachers who had sent in their assignments and I had marked, I had checked and evaluated and had given my feedback. So I think I mean, a big round of applause to all the teachers who have found time out from their hectic schedule during the weekdays. And, and you wouldn't believe I got the response in five days. So I think that was something phenomenal that was remarkable in itself. Well, today's session is going to be equally amazing, equally you know, exciting and engaging. And I'm sure this can be possible with all the you know, support from the teachers and participants on board, both on our live forum over here, as well as on Facebook. So without much ado, let's take a look at what the session today is going to offer. A quick understanding of, into the web, o, overview of the webinar. We are going to understand some edtech tools. Of course, I'll be engaging you. So talking about edtech tools, I would quickly request all the participants who are there with us on Facebook and on the Zoom forum to uh, download the app Z Jamboard, okay? So if you already have Jamboard, well, you may relax. If you do not have the app Jamboard, it's J-A-M-B-O-A-R-D. So I would request all of you to quickly download Jamboard and be ready so that when we you know, take part in the task, that's a collaborative approach. And let's see how interestingly you can participate over there and share your responses. Well, engagements and activities, there are going to be some kind of uh, activities which I would ask all of you to share your thoughts on and collaborate, and let's see how best we can do that. We are also looking at the strategies to write with sophistication. So this is something that will be the highlight of the session today. Some quick fix tips, some quick fix strategies that you could immediately you know, take back to your classes tomorrow itself and give it to your learners and you, know, you just revamp your teaching process and help them understand narrative writing. Most of the learners at times, you know, in schools, and I've often found even teachers telling me that uh, it becomes very difficult for them to understand. It becomes very difficult for them to write a story. Although, you know, surprisingly, each one of us is amazing at storytelling. And storytelling is, uh, is a skill which learners are being taught in schools right from grade two. And I think they can actually uh, write amazing stories but then somehow they can speak story, uh, narrate those things in a spoken format, but it becomes a little challenging for them when they want to translate that 
into written format and as per the grade level expectations of the curriculum as they grow up. So we'll look into how to best you know, inculcate those strategies into our teaching learning. Annotating some sample questions. Of course, I've taken up um, a couple of questions on the past paper of IGCAC and we'll see how you will help me to annotate the question in the light, but that's for the later time. And of course, the greatest takeaway, uh, some useful links and resources. So you will find them uh, at the end. And but the cherry on the cake today is wait for my nine golden tips to write amazing and effective narrative writing. Okay, so wait for my nine golden tips. Do not miss out on that. But that is something which is going to really help you understand what narrative writing is all about. Well, we talk about types of stories. So we always keep on talking about stories. There are children you will find they uh, share stories right from the uh, level they enter school. Something had gone wrong in school. Something, you no, know, they had a not, they had met a nice person in school, their friend, or maybe they had a fight, or maybe on their way back home they had encountered some strange incident or even which would like to share something that they come and talk about without any kind of restriction, without any kind of hesitation. At times they also add spice to it. So that's fine. And that's exactly how we can you know, encourage our learners, encourage children around of all ages to talk. So I've charted over here some kind of types of stories which you could you know, uh, help your learners to identify. You can talk about realistic fiction. You can give examples of adventure. They could be mystery. Of course, they could also write science fiction. But as I mentioned, uh, as I go about with this particular process of helping to unfold the various kinds of stories, we need to understand the conventions. We need to understand the elements associated with each and every kind as well. Though there are some uniform uh, concepts which are in an umbrella uh, uh, format existing. We talk about personal stories, vacations, family stories. Yes. Now, after the lockdown, or you will find some amazing stories come up. In the, during the lockdown as well, you will find stories of stories being built up. And that's something very fascinating. They have probably written some novels by now. And you could tell them, okay, talk about stories, talk about your personal anecdotes, personal tales about how you spent your lockdown. You will come up with some beautiful stories, right? Pictures are some great tools, again, some great stimulus, which you can start with at the basic level to help them understand, to ideate. So the process of ideation is extremely important when you help them to gather those tips and collect those dots with help of pictures. Horror stories, our learners at times, you know, they have a penchant for writing horror stories and also science fiction, because you know, a lot goes on with the futuristic appeal. There's a lot of things happening around us. They are too much glued into gadgets and technology and whatnot, artificial intelligence. They are into cloud computing and they love to imagine a world you know, where it would be. So they might be reading some kind of stuff which can translate into writing those kind of stories as well. Slice of life stories are very interesting. You know, They revolve around a particular incident or event that has taken place in a person's life. Over there, we can talk about how the character can be brought to fore, can be brought to light. And there could be a lot of spotlight on the character where you could talk uh, about the feelings of the character with respect to, you can develop the character over time, how the character has evolved and then understood uh, with the rising action. You could take up those elements of climax as well. So that is something very, very engaging that you could do. Slice of life stories are uh, very engaging. Fables, myths, and legends. Again, uh, these skills and these uh, types of stories, we teach them right from the secondary checkpoint level and bring them up to writing fables which have a moral myths and legends, which and, and I, I know a lot of learners who are so interested and glued to reading, you know, Percy Jackson, even uh, they have those kind of you know, fiction myths and mythological stories and stuff with respect to Greek mythology. And so they are, they're very interested. They, they love to watch the Game of Thrones, uh, Thrones and stuff. And uh, they would really let their imagination go wild. So you could actually tap on all those creative 
uh, talent, uh, the potentials of the learners and help them to you know, uh, understand how best the elements of story could be taken ahead. So let's see. Now, talking about that, something that is very interesting, something that is very um, crucial for us to understand at this stage is you know, the elements of story. If I may quickly request uh, the participants on board over here to share in the chat box what, according to you, are the basic elements of a story? How do you build up the elements? How do you build up a story? Can we have some quick responses? Yeah, I'm looking for uh, responses. Sure. Uh, meanwhile, on Facebook, uh, there is a request, Mr. Abhinandan. They want you to go a little slow so oh. as to allow them to form. Sure. Uh, so one is character des description, uh, narrative, setting, then uh, free tags, traditionally, uh, creative is in media, then uh, conflict, theme, climax, raising action. Excellent. Wow. I okay. Think... Elements of free tags, pyramid, resolution, types of conflict, so on and so forth. Yes. Okay. Great. So on that, I think, I think we have got some amazing responses. Uh, from Facebook, did we get some response? Yes. On Facebook, setting, plot, characterization, and theme. Uh, main idea, characters, and plot, uh, plot setting, introducing mysterious things, conversation, okay. plot development. So we're getting a lot of description and turn of events. Uh, okay. Ending is also important. Okay, great. I think we have all, almost all the points. We missed out on one or two. We'll see. And, you know, that's exactly what... I have included those one or two points that we missed out specifically in my session today. Uh, I know some of you also mentioned about the conflict. So if I may ask on that note, what is the first thing that you would ask your learners to begin writing in a story or thinking rather when they're planning? What is the first thing that you should actually ask your learners to start thinking with? Any responses? Uh, conflict, setting, uh, create the mode, natural setting, the theme. Okay. And uh, tightly knit points, character setting, plot and conflict, the topic. Okay. So these plot. are great, excellent. Quite a lot of varied answers. Well, uh, some of you had been right. You actually must start with the problem. Every story has a problem. Okay? And we'll see how. You take up any story. If a story doesn't have a problem, that's a blast story. It's not interesting. You would never bother to read that story if a story doesn't have a problem. So, the best solution is to let the learners, to allow the learners think by starting with the problem. What happens more often than not is if you start with the character, the character goes astray and then you do not know where to go. And then the, there's a deviation. And that is exactly where we find most of our learners writing irrelevant stuff because they have identified the problem. So identifying the conflict in a story is extremely important. So on that note, I would take you to the elements of a story, which most of you have already shared. So we start, this is an exposition. This is a typical free tax pyramid. It's a plot, plotting of the story over here, the structure or organization of events that make up a story. So what do we start writing in a story? First, the conflict or the problem. There you, after that, you talk about the characters, you talk about the setting. So that goes into your introduction. So now that you have an engaging introduction, your story has a definitive you know, aim. You have created a roadmap for yourself. The learners now know, the writer knows, now where I need to take my character. If my character has to be the protagonist or the antagonist, I know where to you know, shape my character in which direction and how. If it's a problem, I know how to address a problem with the rising action. So then, my next paragraph I talk about, in my next segment, I talk about the rising action. Because every story will have a rising action. Which are the events before the climax? 
characters attempt to solve the problem but fails. Very important is to push your character or characters into some kind of problematic situation, into some kind of challenge, and enabling your character to find solution to those problems. So probably in the first two paragraphs, you are tackling the idea of how the character goes about solving the problem but fails miserably or is not successful. So that will lead you to the next component. In the next paragraph, you talk about how he makes further attempt to solve the problem. This is the way you are showing the rising action in place. Gradually, we move to the climax of the story, which is a turning point which we will talk about in detail. Now, amidst all these, the point which I have not got from any of the participants, maybe someone mentioned conversation, but then how do we put the conversation? So the word that we use over here is dialogues. Dialogues are extremely important when children write their stories. Well, there's a word of caution. When we say dialogues are important, it shouldn't happen that the child is making the entire story a proper representation of a dialogue. There shouldn't be dialogues all throughout. There should be you know, a balanced, a holistic blend or use of dialogues, which will lend a certain definitive approach to the entire story. After the climax comes our falling action, the denoma, let me say, we talk about how the the problems are solved and we are reaching a consensus. At this stage, you might also like to talk about the reversal or how the character undergoes some kind of transformation or ha how has the character evolved through the plot of the story? How have you taken the character all throughout the interaction of this character, the protagonist with the other characters, if any, and how they reach some kind of solution or resolution? So resolution again, is very important in a story because then with the resolution, you talk about how to bring the conflicts to some kind of end, how we find a solution to the problems and then our story is complete. Now at this stage, I know some of you might be asking, there are so many learners at Time Temporary Mind, I know they want to you know, leave a story in cliffhanger. So it is again uh, advisable not to, uh, not to you know, uh, encourage so much into cliffhanger unless you are sure that the learners are very capable and very you know efficient in writing a proper cliffhanger story. Because story writing is a little challenging. All the elements are not blended in and they really go haywire with respect to the, the, the elements and all the uh, you know components are not there, all the features are not there. They are not binding it well and they do not know how to even write succinctly. That is precisely where they exceed the word limit, right? So there we again have to keep a check. Now, this is something very interesting. The eight point story arc, which uh, you know, I've researched and found out and I've learned and I've you know, tried to you know, curate it over here in my uh, version, in my, uh, with my viewpoint over here in my manner. So eight point story arc, so it go clockwise starting from stasis. Now, what is a stasis? In the stasis, uh, it's nothing but a kind of equilibrium, a kind of balance that you want to establish for the character. Say, for example, if we uh, talk about a young man uh, who is living in a poverty stricken condition and uh, he stays with his mother and he looks after the cows and he, we talk about his setting. We, we talk about the hut that he stays in. Like, for example, in Jack and the Beanstalk. Or we talk about, say, a boy with a scar and he's trying to live amongst the civilians, amongst the muggles, and uh, he's trying to cope with the challenges of the Dursleys. So we know we're talking about the setting of Harry Potter and we introduce a character. So stasis is all about the character, the setting that we talk about and create an equilibrium. Now, after that, we move on to the trigger. Trigger is an element which takes you to a rising action. So what happens when you talk about, say, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk? We, he goes to the market, he finds, he meets a man, and he's trying to you know, come out of his uh, state of abject penury, 
and he meets this man uh, who is selling magic beans. He gets interested. Or you talk about uh, Harry Potter. Now he goes and he receives the letter of acceptance into Hogwarts. That that shows the path of rising action. Or uh, take up any other you know uh, story uh, which I read or which I studied. Children are familiar with. Say for example Cinderella. So how the uh, fairy godmother comes and you know waves the magic wand and tries to play some role into transforming Cinderella from a poor miserable girl to a lady who can go to the ball. So that's a trigger. So you put those points over here, and the moment you put the trigger, that's a conflict. That's a the problem that you're placing over there. So what they do not have, what they uh, you know lack, and what are they trying to confront? Then comes the quest. The character moves on. You, know, you sh let the ball rolling. The character goes ahead in search for something, in search for gaining new knowledge, in search for defeating another uh, you know uh, character. And at this moment, it would also be a good option. Like immediately after quest in the surprise stage, it would be a good idea to introduce a new character. So that's a surprise element. Surprise also can be you know clubbed with the idea of suspense. So maybe you're trying to withhold some idea and information in the previous paragraph, wherein you try to you know, just foreshadow something is going to happen. You're, you're trying to just impose the idea of the approach of something or maybe a letter. So those uh, elements are so interesting and they take your story forward. They help you in building the story idea and the entire plot ahead. Critical choice is the next stage where the, the character will have to make some kind of choice. Either it could be a pleasant choice, it could be a positive uh, choice, it could be a negative choice. If it's a positive choice, of course the character will try to move forward. He will try to go ahead. Maybe he's trying to get some kind of success in terms of the choice he has made, the decision he has made. If it's a negative critical choice, of course, a negative outcome, he will go on a retrogress, okay? So he will try to uh, just stop his development over there and he will, that, 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 is way, that is one way you're showing the failure in the attempt to solve the problem, okay? And which is what will lead us to the next stage of climax, which is so important. Are there some important twists in our tale? Are there some twists? What happens? Oh, who comes next? Uh, is there some kind of a strange moment that's going to take place? Say, for example, uh, she kept the papers on the table and walked away. Now the question comes, what are the papers for? Are there some kind of you know court papers? Are they some kind of so attorney papers? What are property papers? Divorce papers? What kind of papers? Are they examination papers? Maybe she's a teacher. See, you reach a climax, but you do not divulge much about it. And then you have some kind of, you know, conflicting interest that you're showing over here still. So you're taking the story ahead, forward. Reversal. So at this stage, probably the writer uh, or the character in your story decides on how far he or she has come. The evolution of the character. Is there some kind of life skill or value that the character has learned? Or is there some kind of message that you wish to portray or you want to convey some kind of message to the readers, to the character? So now, after that, we'll go to the resolution. Now, resolution is where we solve the problem, we reach an ending, a definitive conclusion, and then we again, go back, we achieve a new stasis over here after the resolution. So there's a balance, there's an equilibrium from where we started and we went around to the entire, to the arc and we came to an end where we again maintained that kind of equilibrium and ended our story. So this is one quick, uh, you know, strategy which you could take back to your learners and really help them understand how a story could be plotted. Well, now something that comes to our mind at this point is who is writing the story? Very interesting. Now, points of view of characters, you really need to understand. A story can be written, you know, you can have a narrative account. Maybe you're, you're writing a you're for first person narrative. So it's like, I am telling the story. It's my perception. It's my uh, story, my life story. So 
that is first person uh, first person narrative second person narratives you know at times they are not very common they're a little challenging but um, th there was a, a story written by a short excerpt by a prayer for the dying by stewart onan so over there the, she, uh, the 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 writer the author talked about say i would like to uh, recollect a little uh, paragraph through the gate and up the walk toward the front door it will be good to get his gun belt off the jacket the boots and then the writer says uh, you have earned your supper and she goes on saying locked just as you instructed you jangle the big key ring searching so no it's like you're talking to somebody who is the second person you're talking to the reader but still you do not know to identify who accurately or specifically the reader is so second person narrative is not very common in fiction but then they are written so if you have identified some writers and if some writers can you know uh, establish that connection to second person narrative please encourage them third person limited and third person omniscient now how do we understand of course we all know what is third person and i'm sure by grade 9 and 10 our learners are very well aware of the idea of what is third person the use of he she it they singular and plural so the narrator over here in the limited third third person limited or option the narrator is outside the story so you're writing from the point of view of a different character or maybe you're writing from the lens of a different character now over here what is third person omniscient you know like uh, and for example some of our writers have often written in third person omniscient it's like you know you are the god it's a god's eye view in third person omniscient you know everything about every character you can actually talk about what the other character is feeling like william shakespeare in all his plays you see he's third person omniscient but he has produced so many characters and he's given rise and given birth to such brilliant work and content and plot mind blowing third person omniscient or you talk about uh, nathaniel hawthorne's the scarlet letter where each and every character has has been shown some kind of evolution over a period of time and every character has his or her own perception so that is third person omniscient so a uh, detailed understanding with between third person omniscient and third person limited with omniscient of course there is no bias or preference if you see the visual over here it's like the eye is painted uh, positioned over there as if it's a god's eye view you have full knowledge of all the characters and situations what's going to happen and what has happened maybe the characters themselves do not know but you know and you are trying to you know uh, explain from that point of view with third person limited you no know, you are as a writer you are trapping yourself in the mind of one particular character and your perspective gets limited that's why third person limited so th this is another uh, good technique so point of view as we have learned so far or revised rather so point of view is a brilliant technique and it should not be you know missed out when you are writing a good story so either you take up a first person point of view third person omniscient third person limited or second person which is not very common it's a little challenging but if you can get your hands at writing second person narrative nothing like it well i hope we are uh, good so far now something that really uh, it comes to our attention and we need to talk to our learners we need to you know explain to our learners big time is having effective beginnings you know that beginning is something very important this struggle with big time you give them the topic maybe from past papers or from some good story prompts worksheet at times even the best of writers in your class you no know, they do not know how to begin not how to start but once you help them with the trigger the ideation and the beginning they know how to set the ball rolling and for after that you know those brilliant writers can actually produce you brilliant work so let's see how effective beginnings also play an important role uh, in narrative writing do we have an unanswered question you can begin with an unanswered question or probably we could begin with an intriguing dialogue 
I have told you so many times not to go to the park. Mary looked at me squarely. So you start with an intriguing dialogue. Something that will immediately, you know, grab the attention of your readers. An unanswered question. You could begin with, say, wasn't this something that we had discussed long before? Began Sarah. And now you don't need to answer that question because it was already discussed long before and that doesn't need further uh, prompt or provocation. But you know, then you can write a sentence. She stared blankly at Adam's face, waiting for an answer, which she knew she would never get. See now, see, look at this, uh, the, 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 the strategy, how I build the character and I brought the, then thereafter you can bring the setting, staring at the, the dilapidated, uh, table or the broken down table in their uh, 100 square feet uh, shack apartment with the plaster stripping off the walls and uh, the, you know, the, the, the roof falling over the head almost in the verge of caving in. So now you're bringing in the kind of you know, setting and the character and you talk about the trigger. You have a problem over there. So probably they're talking about their finances. The couple is talking about you know, how that's a problem, how they can come out of it. You can directly show the action. He barged out, barged into the room, or he stormed out of the room, mouthing some expletives. That's an action. An unusual character. This is something very interesting. You could start with a character. Maybe you could not name the character, but talk about the appearances, talk about the features. You know, like some of those uh, opening characters in uh, the thing, uh, things fall apart how the character of Okonko was built up over time and even his father, Unoko. So oh, the entire description was so profound. It was unusual. You talk about the features. Maybe you had, he was a lanky, scrawny man, gingerly, you know, drooping shoulders, holding something gingerly out. I had a mole or a head poke marked face. And then you talk about the name of the character. What is a you know, uh, relevance of the character with respect to our plot or with respect to our story. So begin with an unusual character and then you give it a roadmap, you had a head start, a conflict to hook the reader. So maybe somebody's fighting or there lands, there he landed a punch on his face. It's a conflict. Immediately the readers are excited. Whoa, whoa, what happened? Why did he, you know, launch an attack? What happened after that? So then you continue the story. Something which is again very interesting over here, eavesdrop on a character's thoughts. So this is again like third person omniscient, or you can also play a third person, a third person a limited uh, uh, point of view over here. That means you are only in that particular character's thought, or maybe the God's eye view, you know what each of the characters are thinking at that particular stage. Like in a, in a detective, or horror, or horror stories or detective stories like Agatha Christie's novels. The characters you know they know very well what each one of them is thinking at times. Or say maybe, you know, on the in the dusk of the hour, at the, at the hour of dusk rather, he knew exactly what he was uh, going through. And suddenly he slipped his hand inside his anorak jacket to touch and to feel the cold metallic tip or, or the muzzle of his revolver. Now, what does he do after that? You're not talking about it. You're building up the climax over here. This shows a rising action. Does, is he a murderer? Is he a criminal? Is he uh, a convict uh, who has you know, uh, run out of the jail? Who is he? So he's dropping on a character's thoughts. Uh, a brilliant, brilliant example of this you might find in Doris Lessing's stories, you know, where they uh, think about what the character might be feeling and what is the next course of action for the character. So that's a good technique. You can also begin with a shock, a murder, like Sherlock Holmes stories often begin with 
So there, there has been a murder somewhere and then the alarm is raised. And then they go on a flashback to talk about how the murder was done and then how it is brought to some kind of climax and then a falling action and then to a resolution. So it could be a murder, it could be a robbery, a kidnapping. So these are some ideas you could, you know, uh, our learners can actually take back home. Of course, sound words, onomatopoeia, crash. And then she turned back to look at the, you know, the pool of blood lying on the floor. Little did she sense uh, what happened over there. On a closer inspection, she moved for forward. She saw a mutilated arm you know, stretching out from behind the sofa. And then you see how the story builds. Talk about the problem first. Talk about the conflict. Then the characters will automatically find some kind of, you know, uh, dimension, some kind of uh, roadmap how to pro proceed with the story. Well, I'll take it up an example from our IGCAC Collins uh, student book. Many of you might be familiar with this. Many of you must have done it in, in the class. So we have a quick recapitulation, recapitulation on that as well. We talk about story openings. You know, let, let's take a look at this example. Although it was almost midnight, I heard the sound of footsteps approaching our house. I opened the door, an ellipsis. You stop over there. See over here in the opening itself, the stasis has been well identified. The character, of course, this is first person narrative. The character well identifies himself or herself with the setting, house. It's moving to some kind of you know, conflict, sound of footsteps, do not know. It's quite interesting. I opened the door. Now, what do you think might be happening after this? Any, any suggestions? Let's see uh, what opinions our participants have to suggest to us. What can happen after this? What are your thoughts? I'm waiting for uh, the answers. And uh, while that happens, uh, Ms. Sophie uh, has asked you a question. Uh, if you'd like to take it, it's up to you. Uh, Please uh, give some examples of popular stories that have a third-person omniscient narrative and a third-person limited narration. Uh, please, uh, because the character was expecting someone, but dot, dot, dot. Okay. And uh, while uh, that happens, we are getting answers both on Facebook as well as uh, Zoom. Right. The first is introduction of settings and other characters. I was shocked to see him. The next one, there is no one. Uh, this may build tension. Uh, but uh, didn't see anyone, but no one was there and uh, saw the enormous figure in the shadows of the night. Uh, is, some, is somebody hiding here? Great, excellent. Okay, to answer Ms. Sophie's question, I think I've already given a couple of examples. I talked about uh, Shakespeare, who is a third person omniscient uh, narrator. You can, uh, I've also given an example of Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, the Scarlet Letter, which is an example of uh, third person omniscient. And third person limited is something which you write uh, considering other, any other novels, any other stories that you uh, feel that you are from the pers character's perspective, you, the writer it's himself or herself is trapped inside the character's mind. And then viewing the entire, he knows how to take the, like it's only from his point of view, his lens, his perspective that he's viewing the entire story. Okay, so that's an example. Yeah, I think uh, we had some uh, excellent responses with respect to this story opening. And uh, yes, so the question was, use the two sentences to start a story and create an interesting narrative. So this is one ready-made example you could take back to your learners and give them and see how they write on this. What are their thoughts? How are they building up on that idea? Okay. That let's see, let's now unpack this particular story. Let's annotate this story. What could be our possible ideas when we want to open this story? Okay, we have a quick plan ahead of us. We can ask by beginning you now who is approaching? Is it a stranger in the house? Is it any other member or members of the family? So we can ask those questions to us to so make a quick plan. That's why mind mapping is very important. Please 
uh, I would strongly advise uh, students to make a mind map because it always gives you a, a roadmap to understanding what I'm going to write in my story eventually. Though in the IGCSE papers, you do not have an opportunity to make a mind map, but of course you can make a quick story plan because you get additional pages, either you make over there or in the beginning of the page, it's up to you. But you make a quick planning that always helps. Planning is always necessary. Now, who are you? Because if you go back to the previous slide, it talks about, I heard the sound of footsteps approaching the house. So it's a good way to ask and analyze yourself. Well, who are you? Are you a teenager in the house? So you get your point of view over here. See, that comes. Are you someone else? Are you an older person or an adult? Now the next question you should ask, why has this person come to your house? Has he come to meet someone, to reveal a secret or to steal something? See, automatically you're talking about, there's a problem, there's a conflict and it shows a trigger to a rising action. Now you build the suspense, you take the action further. What will happen next? You are making a critical choice. Is there an argument? Will there be a chase? Is there a mysterious event in the offing? What might have happened earlier? Now you are making a flashback and trying to find some kind of you know, uh, suggestions to this. Are there other visitors as well? Is there someone who is watching the house for weeks together? So see, you are now going beyond the realm and scope of a limited approach to writing your uh, ideas and writing your story. So probably someone has been watching over the house for quite some time. And then as we have the story opening over here, sound of footsteps approaching because we know the setting, the house, we know the time. It was almost midnight and automatically creates that kind of mood and atmosphere. I open the door. And then it's like some kind of suspense. We don't know who's there, who comes. So this is how we make a quick plan. If we help our learners to make a quick plan, it shouldn't take much time. If we do it re regularly and if we maintain the rigor, they will actually find some kind of definitive approach to writing their stories. Now, on that note, let us figure out what a good narrative is made up of. It needs a strong opening to hook the reader. We discussed that. We'll browse through these points because I have taken up in a summary, a quick recapitulation a slide after some strategies, after some uh, learning. It needs a complex, interesting narrative and events must be told in an original way. So as I mentioned, wait for my nine golden tips. Do not go because those are those nine golden tips which you would definitely want to take to your learners if you want an A star in English at least with respect to narrative writing. You want your learners writing amazing narrative writing. And also I'm sure most of the questions that you are uh, you know, trying to raise in your mind, of course, they will be answered. Original way I say, because you know, at times our learners present a nightmare, a dream, they end up writing, oh, I just woke up, the alarm rang, or my mother just pushed me and it was a horrible dream. So that is something that we would like to do away with and steer clear off. We do not want uh, to write uh, dream sequences or nightmares or any kind of hallucinations out here, no. Has a carefully managed ending that fits with the story as a whole. So of course, as I mentioned, it's good for some writers or some uh, students who feel that they are very competent enough to write a good uh, cliffhanger, otherwise, for a safe, on a safer side, it's very important to bring the story to a closure with a definitive ending. Use flashback. Of course, a good narrative uses flashback. That's a very good technique with the writer recalls, okay, what happened? Or goes back on an earlier time and tries to you know, bring out and show some kind of rising action, maybe some kind of you know, critical choices he made over there that is shaping his decisions right now. And how has he evolved over time that shows his reversal <coughs> in that eight point story arc. So flashback is a good technique. Includes a surprise, of course. A story must have a surprise or a suspense. So things are not as they first appear. So what is the surprising element over there? Is there some kind of you know, suspense coming up? No, when you talk about 
you open the door dot 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 who comes next i don't know no one knows so there comes the originality of the student to build up the plot it could be anybody maybe you it doesn't appear as uh, you know things are not as they appear maybe it's not something dangerous it's maybe it's not something you know uh, there is no element of fear there is no element of foreboding but there is something else which you do not know maybe the re reader is, is not aware of so we can build up the suspense by taking or introducing some new character over there or somebody else withholds information doesn't divulge everything at once yeah a very powerful trait and strategy of a good narrative do not lay all your cards open in the first instance do not give out so much of information in the first go withhold the information and open the you uh, know uh, the cards bit by bit build up the suspense build up the climax reach the you know uh, the rising action the tip of the apex the rising action, the climax and then come down gradually to show the kind of dinoma and of course uses detailed description and ambitious vocabulary there is no alternative to this as i mentioned in my previous webinar on descriptive writing you know you cannot have story you cannot have a narration in a descriptive writing but you need to have a very good descriptive piece and descriptive elements in a narrative writing there is no alternative to that so use detailed description and ambitious vocabulary when i talk about ambitious vocabulary mind you it needs to be contextual it cannot uh, go as straight you, know, you talk about uh, maybe a character who is developing and you talk about a story how a couple wants you know gift each other maybe you're talking about something on the lines of gift of the magi and over there you suddenly cannot talk about you know uh, something too fantasy based or something too historical based so you need to use vocabulary which is relevant and contextual now i have some sample openings although it was almost midnight i heard the sound of footsteps approaching our house i opened the door full stop in front of me stood my brother paulo he had gone missing 10 years earlier you kind of my flashback i'm automatically blending in my idea of flashback and although he had changed i knew it was him now this is one sample i have a second sample although it was almost midnight i heard the sound of footsteps approaching our house i opened the door for a moment i peered into the darkness you are extending the idea that suspense is lingered you're not divulging all the information at one go you're asking a question was there some someone there or not i took a step forward and a hand grabbed my shirt look at it immediately you have some kind of you know conflict over here immediately you have some kind of rising action showing action you a question one word i gasped suddenly i was 5 years old again look at the technique of flashback playing in the yard making a mess making our mother yell at me so of course when you talk about 5 years old again it gives you the idea so he is maybe your sibling making our mother so that you no know, again our the pronoun our it gives the first person sense our mother yell at me automatically gives you the idea oh it's your brother or maybe it's your sibling right and you have gone back in time so now over here maybe it would be a good idea for them to think why did he, who is this person who has come maybe your brother he went away why did he go away even in the first question he went away 10 years ago he had gone missing why had he gone missing was he kidnapped or was he abducted or did he leave the house or did he uh, just go out without telling your parents or maybe you are aware of his whereabouts where he had gone see now with all those triggered ideas and trigger thoughts it helps you to take the story further ahead right well and when we talk about characters of course we cannot stop thinking about our setting which is very very important so we have to decide what mood you are trying to establish decide which period or moment best fits the context of your story again that's important because when i talked about the slide showing types of stories 
So it talks about a particular period. You know, it decide on something. Okay, I can base my story either in a beach side or I can base my story in a mountain top. I can base my story maybe at a park. I can base my story in my living room. I can base my story at a bar, at a cafeteria. I can base my story maybe uh, in a train, right? So there could be so many possibilities. Know the atmosphere you need to portray, very important. As in the connection of the present question that we're discussing today, you no, know, it was almost midnight. It creates an atmosphere. And then you talk about, I heard footsteps approaching. It creates an atmosphere. It creates an element of foreboding, right? And then you talk about, I opened the door. So your heart, there's a rising excitement, the palpitation, there's an adrenaline. What happens next? Who comes next? So incorporate all the elements of a story setting is very important. We can use our five senses when describing the setting, absolutely. Don't describe the setting of a story all at once. Yeah, in the introduction paragraph, don't give in, okay, this was in a house set in the, vill uh, in the village top or in a valley amidst the lush greenery in the Viridian valleys or something like that. No, no need. Unravel bit by bit. Retain the suspense, suspense all throughout. Let the surprise element build and rise up. Don't over describe the setting of a story because it'll kill the charm. And again, if you do that, you are again deviating from the actual plot of the story. Mind you, we have 350 to 450 words and we need to be succinct. And there are learners who generally tend to you know, go overboard in the, uh, with the way they write their stories. They cannot you know, encapsulate the entire idea in a succinct manner. Of course, they lose marks, that will be penalized. That, that, that leads to self-penalization. Remember that the setting of a story has a direct effect on the character and plot. Very important. The setting needs to be identified in the stasis. As I mentioned, the eight point arc story arc. The stasis is important. When you talk about the Harry Potter, or the, the boy with the scar, the boy who lived, stayed with the Dursies amongst the muggles in Midtown England. So I'm using the setting over there automatically. Or uh, a middle-aged man who stayed with his mother in a poverty stricken condition, tending to uh, looking after the cows in the barn, okay? And of course, I'm talking about Jack and the Beanstalk. I'm creating a setting. I'm using that in the stasis itself. So remember, the story must have a direct effect on the character and the plot. Now, time for activity once again. There are some uh, pictures that I have taken up. I need each one of you. I've also numbered it for your convenience. So when you answer in the chat box, please put the image number and come up with words and phrases to describe the setting over here. And then I will have an interesting session again with you. I'm sure we could have some responses. They're coming in. Uh, the first is a cozy home. Then uh, one again is warm, uh, a cozy house, okay. two vibrant. Uh, one, a uh, bright palarial parlor. Uh, one, garden summer picnic. So these are the answers that I see on uh, Zoom. On Facebook, uh, just looking for answers. Uh, meticulous looking drawing room. Uh, someone has written a huge sentence. The hall was as enormous as a resort where the lights were entering through the window, illuminating the whole room. Four, multi-hued amusement park. More answers. <laughs> War zone and uh, vulnerable. That's the fifth. Okay. Yeah. You want some more answers on, from Facebook? Yeah, maybe with... Uh... Uh, jumbled ways, three jumbled ways, one warm and comfortable for amusement park, two in the lap of nature, uh, comfortable room with tranquility, uh, then lu luxurious hotel, what's that? I think that's uh, one. Uh, then uh, four, this was an unforgettable day when I was going to college tour uh, along with my friends. The location is Wonderland, Bangor. 
I know you should say that. So uh, these are the various answers: three of fantasy land. However, I'm not seeing much of answers for five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was a challenge. Here is smoke for day five. I think Miss Ann Philip uh, is given an answer. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So the third one is more about no, a futuristic world. So you could create no when you have a story set in a futuristic world, maybe with a lot of you know uh, technology boom, and we are living in a world which Ray Bradbury had conceptualized and envisioned in his work. Right, with uh, the fifth image, and I, I didn't find any kind of uh, word or phrase to describe the setting over here. So probably this could be. Uh, a war torn zone where people are trying to help each other. Maybe it's a dystopian world where you find this pain and suffering. So the story can be set in that kind of uh, setting as well, right? So, okay, do we have any more responses from Facebook as such that we could take a couple of more responses? Yeah, um, we have a response for five, okay. uh, which uh, reiterates what you'd say. Uh, it is a dis Dystopian setting, yes, so. evil, destruction, and death. Then again, five, the area is covered with debris. The dilapidated buildings reminded of war torn area. Excellent. Yeah, good. And uh, four, fun filled, boisterous day in the fun park. Mm -hmm. Five, dark, drab, industrial waste. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Great. So now, we understand, as I mentioned to you, uh, this was a quick activity, a quick warm up to help understand what are the various kinds of settings. Now, setting can be multifunctional. When we talk about a place locally, if you observe this slide very carefully, I've divided the multifunctional setting aspects into four parts. Now, with respect to time, with respect to season, with respect to new worlds, the futuristic world, maybe a new planet, somewhere in space, deep inside the ocean. You can write a story over there, right? I remember there was this uh, story that was asked a topic, write a story with the title, Underwater. So what you talk about, how to write the story with respect to underwater as a title. So it'll be a new world. We talk about a place or a locale. Of course, we talk about the landscape that you've seen in the slide before where you identified a wonderful, cozy picnic spot in the midst of nature, surrounding atmosphere. Of course, if you had observed the five images, each image, each picture had some kind of atmosphere to talk about, some kind of atmosphere to share over there. We talk about time. So with the setting, of course, we talk about genre, the mood created, the plot. In which time has it been set? Is it a period story? based on some historical time? Do we have some Mughal characters? Do we have Alexander? Do we, do we go to the stage of Napoleon and in the maybe somewhere we talk about Holocaust era? Is my story set over there? Is my story set in some kind of uh, the after effects of a character that I'm trying to bring out after the Second World War or maybe the atomic bomb explosion in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? How the character has tried to narrate that story through his lens, or maybe you have uh, the, the, the writer, the student had actually researched a lot about that era or the kind of you know, aftermath and wants to build or create a character that will be the originality post the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombing or somebody, a character in America post nine by 11 attacks, socio-political times, right? Talk about the COVID times, lockdown, as I mentioned, there could be amazing stories written on that. You could have somebody writing fantasy story as well. You could have somebody writing uh, even a dystopian novel, a dystopian story during lockdown, talking about mental health and then uh, talking about other aspects of the story, you know, weaving the plot and connecting the aspects so wonderfully. When we talk about new worlds, as I mentioned, is it under the ocean? Is it in a future world where you have the entire world is set up or clustered into some submarines and you have set up your world, set up your life, and the story is being narrated from within a submarine, because that is the kind of future 
houses that you'll be having, or rather, you know, the, the devastating stage of man infiltrating or intruding into the space of the marine uh, animals, which we already started doing now. We talk about season. With the season also, you can talk about uh, the setting of the story, climate, a pathetic fallacy. So you talk about, okay, the, the groaning, uh, the, the, the clustered, we are the groaning trees or the groaning woods. So it's actually the woods which are not groaning. It's you who is groaning, maybe you, you who is in pain, and then you are trying to bring it, the idea over there. You associate that pathetic fallacy, right? If I talk about the groaning table, that is a personification. Over there, the table is groaning. I'm trying to talk about some, you know, I'm at, attributing the human life quality to the inanimate object. That becomes my personification. So I can create setting, I can create the characters accordingly, echoing the fate of the character. When you talk about a climate with a pathetic fallacy, of course I'm talking about the mood of the character or the stage the character is in. You talk about a party with you know vibrant balloons, dancings, sprightly all around. So you talk about your jubilant mood. You're happy, you're so overjoyed, right? So setting automatically in a party or in, in the woods, with climate, you can talk about the, uh, you can create a setting as well. So this idea, you know, this uh, represent this visual will really help you to take back that kind of understanding and also uh, our weaker learners who are still grappling with the idea of penning down a wonderful story, the strategizing will really help over there. Now, I would like uh, Mr. Srikant to share uh, the link of the Jamboard. As I mentioned earlier, I'm sure most of you are using Jamboard. It's quick activity, let's see. So I would also request Mr. Srikant to monitor the Jamboard page over there. One second, I'm uh, just getting into it. So uh, while this happens, we request all of you to download an app called Jamboard. The spelling is J-A-M-B-O-A-R-D. We may not have, we may not devote much time to this, maybe a couple of minutes, just to you know, acquaint the teachers with the idea. I'm sure many of the teachers must be aware of this uh, tool. Maybe a couple of ideas you could pin up and you could use it for your class as well. So the question is, why are dialogues important? So just in brief, if you are finding the idea of Jamboard a little uh, challenging right now, you can also share your ideas in the chat box. That will help, not an issue. So why are dialogues important? Any responses in the chat box? I'm looking for responses. Okay, uh, describes a character, uh, blows life into the characters uh, to move the story ahead, to communicate, to reveal a character's intention, making make the characters lively and rocking. Rollicking, okay. Uh, to make it more relatable. Excellent, yes. And... Uh, on Facebook, it is uh, to express the thoughts. Yes, absolutely. To express your thoughts. Yes. To talk about relationships between characters because dialogues are very important to establish that relation. Yes. yes. Uh, creates a connection to set the story in motion, uh, better expression to reveal something, shows uh, not tells. Absolutely. It's more of a visual rather than uh, vocal. Uh, it helps in understanding the mode of the current, the current mode, uh, and then characters interact. So there is a question: How to use a Jamboard? So uh, if okay. uh, Mr. Abhinandan, you could share the link on chat. Uh, perhaps uh, we could, you know, uh, or if we have Mr. Uh, Manish Bagul, who could help us with sharing the link on Facebook chat, the comment section of Facebook.
is my screen coming through or has uh, your screen, screen is coming through yes yes yeah okay i would request mr manish to send the link i'm uh, uh, waiting for mr manish no problem it's okay this is not that important at this stage but it was just to acquaint the teachers with the edtech tool because it's something very engaging your learners will enjoy during the virtual learning stage where you know introducing some one or tool one fine day will definitely you know help them engage better so as yes. uh, some of the uh, participants over here mentioned about the importance of dialogue so you can just have a quick run through so because dialogue is something very important for a creative narrative it's one of the most difficult elements for students yeah because many students really grapple with the idea of writing dialogues and maybe they write an entire paragraph only filled up filled with dialogues and stuff so those are certain things that we need to uh, keep in mind we could give students only at times you know uh, test them assess them on how they have written a dialogue like that is something which i really wanted to talk about in the beginning so when you are giving a story opening so do not ask the uh, children at times to write the entire story of 350 words ask them maybe divide your work into shorter assignments you ask some students maybe on one day you ask them i am going to assess only on your story openings and you set a rubric for that and a required number of marks or uh, for the second assignment you ask them okay on the same story now i just want to see how well you take the dialogues forward and i am just going to mark you on the dialogues so when you set those rubrics and parameters for the learners eventually they are conscious about okay this is my focus point this is my criterion that my teacher will be looking forward to instead of the whole or the overall approach that okay i'll be marked on so many factors and i might go wrong and then so many things are kept in mind so initially from you know early grade 8 or early grade 9 if you start working on bit by bit with only story opening or dialogue or climax today i'm going to mark you on the climax how well you have built up the rising action so i think that will really uh, engage the learners and they will learn the processes all throughout uh, quite well so when a new speaker talks it needs to be on a new line so these are the, the, again the format the structure the punctuation rules are different if the attribution is in the beginning middle or end so of course the the uh, the com commas the inverted comma the speech marks how they need to be placed again our children at times go totally haywire with respect to the commas with this uh, interrogative sentence a question as a dialogue and then they put a comma which is not right there's always a beginning and ending quotation mark to indicate the part of the sentence that is being spoken so that's why you no know, uh, it's a good practice maybe one worksheet you could devise only for helping them to understand how good dialogues and how well dialogues can be written and they can be blended to write a good story now the most important part of writing a good story how to work towards an effective climax now climax is something important because we need to show the suspense rising action and then we come to resolution because otherwise the story cannot progress right building up on the same prompt that we started in the beginning let's see we are developing the skills over here are you able to grab the reader's attention is that happening right mysterious stranger at the door turns out to be brother paulo we have a flashback why he left has returned because he's penniless living rough wants me to steal food for him from the cupboard makes me promise not to tell parents and then we reach a climax parents catch me and brother in the kitchen and the ending they forgive him for running away all is well or you could have some sample twists like this which can lead up to the climax better my parents hugged my brother and we all sat down around our small wooden kitchen table the setting is there my father poured us all some water with lime juice then my brother sighed i have something else to tell you he got up went to the door and opened it now see look at the twist rising action i have something else to tell you short dialogue and then he rises up he gets up opens the door what is he what, what is it now mr srikant am i ma is my screen coming through am i audible yes yes okay thank you so then lot of questions come to your mind who is it coming has he got married or is he with some secret agency or some uh, organization that is working undercover does he want all those friends of his as accomplices to take shelter in the house which he 
couldn't tell in the beginning. You see, so many things that can be talked about. Or the second sample, as we sat there drinking lime water, I looked at my brother again as he raised the glass to his lips. There was something wrong, something not right. What was wrong? Maybe you know that this is not exactly how your brother raises the glass to his lips. Is he a doppelganger? Is he somebody else in the, in the appearance of your brother? So you're trying to figure out. See the sample twist. So many things can happen. And finally, for a story to end, we need to have a proper resolution. How you see the character has resolved the conflict after multiple, multiple you know, attempts which have gone kaput. Now they have failed, but then eventually the resolution was reached and it was like, okay, everything came to a, a good ending. So what are our quick checklists for success? Settings and descriptions are vivid and interesting. So these are some quick takeaways. Characters are clearly drawn. They should be detailed, believable, with the right balance of dialogue and action. Use of complex but appropriate and varied sentence structures and ambitious vocabulary for effect. It's again a quick recapitulation of what we've done so far. Managing elements such as climax and ending well, fitting them to the story, very important. And the story contains the main structure of introduction, development, climax and ending, and includes features such as flashback, twists, and holding back information. And definitely, there is a wide range of imagery and sensory ideas. So all these ideas you will find in our Collins IGCAC FLE student book and the workbook. I'm sure most of you are, are teaching through our Collins book and they're wonderfully curated, wonderfully you know, talked about all these uh, samples. You will get these ideas, but some of these you know, ideas I've curated and developed and added uh, with my understanding and with my uh, reading and stuff. Now this is uh, where we have our time to annotate. Write a story with the title, A Quiet Life. Write a story about an event you dreaded, but which turned out differently from how you expected. So this is my assignment uh, to the first 25 learner, or 25 participants over here on board. So you uh, can send me within the next 10 days. And yes, I'm going to share a lot of good resources to all the participants who shared their assignments with me, their feedback with me, the responses for the descriptive writing and those who will be sending for the narrative writing. So I'm making a bunch of, it's a repository of resources, which I'll be mailing to all those teachers when I get the responses, right? And I'm giving an individual feedback to each one of you. So unpack the question, a quiet life. Is that a problem? Why has a life gone quiet? Is it in a room? Uh, maybe the character has faced some kind of grave threat earlier. His life has become quiet. Is there some kind of trauma that he's trying to nurse or he or she's trying to nurse? Or maybe the life was actually very happening and then suddenly there has been a death in the family. Is a problem and how you're trying to narrate the story. Talk about an event you dreaded, but which, you turned, out, which turned out differently from how you expected. So say, for example, you wanted to uh, deliver a speech in your graduation ceremony and you were always you know, uh, you, fought, you fought shy of stage presence. You never had the courage. But then, actually, when you were encouraged and suddenly with some kind of motivation, you reached up on the center of the stage and you made your first speech and you get, got some kind of you know, appreciation and applause, the experience was something different. It turned out exactly opposite to what you'd expected earlier. So see how you start with a problem, with a conflict of the character, and then you eventually come to a resolution when everything happens well. <clears throat> this is taken from our IGCSE rubrics, the marking scheme. We need some specific criteria. So 16 out of 40. So we have 16 marks for the content and structure. So you have all these things. Of course, you can watch the uh, video of this and you have this particular slide as well. So I've categorized one for descriptive writing, one for narrative writing with specific criteria in place. So it gives a clear understanding to our learners as well if we share them with uh, in the classroom and of course with respect to uh, the style and accuracy of language because it's a written paper there's a lot of weighting of marks and percentage for the written component so we have 24 marks out of 44 <clears throat> the language the style and accuracy of language however 
my last uh, note over here, the, my parting note, with a ready to take task, which each one of you will find it really impressive. I've used it in my earlier webinar as well on in the lower secondary checkpoint. And it was a great hit. I got a lot of uh, uh, responses and appreciation from, uh, from the teachers. And yeah, this was something very good. It's like a one-stop activity which you could give to your learners to tomorrow itself in the class and ask them to, you know, cook up a wonderful story. So how does it go? I have named it as spinner yarn. So it's like a yarn, you take the you know, balls of wool and the different colors to weave a sweater or a cardigan or a pullover. So you spin a yarn and you create something amazing. So let's see how we can showcase our writing skills. So you could take, it, uh, take this to your learners tomorrow itself. There are four segments. You have a character segment, you have a setting segment, you have a time segment and a situation and challenge. So you can ask, each one of your learners in class, okay, pick a character, a setting, a time period, and a situation, and use the combination to write out a story. And then put it up in your classroom jute board, or maybe on a jam board, or maybe even you can create a Padlet in the class with individual stories over there. And then you collate all the Padlet ideas and you can uh, download as a PDF and share. So it's a wonderful learn. You can do peer learning over there, sharing each other's ideas each other's stories and you'll get so many stories. See with one activity, with one slide, you'll get so many stories, so many ideas, a new setting each time, a new time that you can they, they pick up, a new challenge that the character is placed in and then the trajectory that they can show eventually. And now my last stage, the nine golden tips, which you must never forget, is this will answer all your questions. Decide on a tense and then stick to it. Do not jump between present and past. The normal narrative tense is past. So other day I, I uh, found one teacher asking me, sir, we can use present tense for narrative writing. No, ideally, please advise your students to use the past tense. And those who try to write in the present usually forget to do so after a while. So it's safer to start off in the past. Okay, know what your last sentence is going to be before you write your first sentence. A narrative has to build up to a climax and lead towards a conclusion which is planned before it starts or it will end lamely or incomprehensibly or the pace will be too slow or too fast. The next tip, don't try to do too much. You can't cover many events and many years in one short composition. That's why they extend the word limit. Select key mo moments and skip over the rest, changing the pace according to the intensity of the moment. Use dialogue by all means, very, very important. If you can punctuate and set it out correctly, but please don't overdo it. That's why I asked the importance of dialogues in the previous slide, in, the, in one of the earlier slides. You shouldn't turn your story into a play, nor should you dilute the effect of occasional and significant moments of speech by giving the characters trivial things to say throughout. Save the speech for important moments. Even narrative needs a description. So you need to help your reader imagine the characters and places by adding significant details to bring them alive. Don't use a first person narrator if you want to die at the end of your story. Now this is something that the learners often make, you know, they, go, they go wrong with, they make a mistake. They, are, they have died long before and then they're narrating. Very funny. It is generally safer to use third person narration over there as it gives you more flexibility and a wider viewpoint. That's why I mentioned point of view is so important. Don't end your story with, and then I woke up in a hospital or it was all a dream. Try to avoid cliches of any kind, including stereotypical characters and predictable outcomes. So all these things I've already talked about, but this is just a one stage where you get all the tips. Keep a balance in the different parts of the narrative an overlong introduction reduces the effect of the middle section where things build up to a climax. And you need to leave yourself time to create a memorable ending. End your narrative deliberately. Stories need a conclusion. No story like, as they say, as Mr. Khan says, you know, picture tabi baki hai, if it's not an ending, that means if it's not a happy ending, it's not an ending at all. So stories need a conclusion where things are either resolved or purposely left unresolved as a cliffhanger, though on the whole, readers prefer to know how a story ended. So of course, we all know, we all want to know how a story ended, right? So don't, don't leave the reader wanting for more because you're not writing a novel over here. 
you are writing for an academic purpose so we need to keep that in mind you must not give the impression that you just stopped writing because you ran out of time most of the time it happens to our learners because they don't have time they overshot the entire time frame and they are somehow abruptly ending and they want to give it they want to pass it on as oh ma'am i or sir i wanted to keep it as a little cliffhanger no we understand what is cliffhanger so it's just half a journey left you know unfinished well and these are your ready to take away websites you must benefit from these you may take a screenshot of this of course i'll be sharing all these websites you know there are amazing excellent sample stories over here with respect to igcac uh, uh format of writing you'll find a lot of helpful you know sites sub sites when you uh, browse through further but this is something very important and as i all as i always mention and end my uh, webinars with this kind of quote i love this quote the curriculum tells you what and not how the how is the artistry of education the meta cognition is important we know what to do we all know what to do but we reach a stage where we need to recapitulate how those strategies need to be brought up in place fitting like an you know the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and then create a wonderful picture so that's something very important and education in the 21st century these skills are very important meta cognition is very important and of course the collins dictionary always help your children to look up words in dictionary to define characters to use good description contextual vocabulary and good language and on that note i wish all my participants all my fellow colleagues my brave hearts a very you know a uh, good evening take care and i end my session today and all the best if you want to reach out to me or team collins these are our email ids you may reach out to us on that note i uh, would like to thank you uh, so much mr abhinandan uh, we usually end with uh, taking a, a set of questions uh, from the uh, either the chat or uh, from zoom uh, so uh, if you got time uh, perhaps we could uh, uh, take one question uh, yes yes we could take sure so this looking for any question that's uh okay okay uh, this is something that i read uh while you doing the webinar so uh, this is from ms shriya narula i don't know if she is uh, there i reckon she is here so uh, a large number of her students are inclined towards homosexuality and come out of are, and are coming out of the closet uh, how can they make such a topic uh, such a topic great uh, from a cliche i mean stories revolving around uh, homosexuality okay that's a very bold question and that's a very good very bold yes yes i really appreciate that kind of a question so i think uh, i at this stage because this is a very sensitive question as well exactly it's a global issue currently so at, on that note i would first ask ms shreya to sit with those learners and have a chat with them or maybe in a virtual forum you just have a discussion with them taking those learners understanding what their points of view are the moment to try to tap on their povs and what kind of characters they are trying to build revolving around the concept of homosexuality i think it will be very clear for the teacher to understand how you want to take it further in your story because see this topic uh, there will be different levels of sophistication and maturity that this kind of sensitive topic may be dealt with uh, dealt uh, with by a learner in grade 10 and a learner in grade 12 and also a learner in grade 8 it's not something you know they are unaware of it's widespread now we are all aware of this lgbtq plus we are all aware of this and there's so much of you not know, uh, so much of talks you know, happening around so much of discussion happening around so of course our learners will be aware of all these and i'm sure i'm very uh, thankful to miss shreya to you know raise this topic over here because i know some of the learners at this particular age and this uh, century they are really experimenting with their uh, sexual orientation as well so if they want to uh create a character without delving too much into some kind of you know uh 
details which might not be academically uh, sophisticated or academically suitable to use i think they can use why not they can talk about that is that is uh, i think wonderful uh, strategy to show towards a trigger or rising action that could be some kind of problem as well if the society because society is still considers it as a problem i mean unfortunately people are not a social taboo yes yeah the the the, the, the uh, society wants to stigmatize yes. so of course you could talk about that from a third third person limited perspective wherein the writer is trapped into one character's mind okay and you are trying to suggest the entire story how it is snowballing into something marvelous and reaching a resolution with the stigma in place and how the character evolves over time so that's why the eight point story arc is so important yeah i great. hope to answer that great yes and uh, we have ms narula also here and uh, uh, she says that she appreciates your thoughts and uh, uh, on uh, behalf of uh, colons i would like to thank uh, mr abhinandan uh, on uh, addressing this issue and not shying away uh, the reason being uh, in literature in language uh, i think language is a source of you know eliminating taboos isn't it uh, absolutely i agree on that mr shrikant because you know uh, see as literature teachers also i think language and literature are two sides of the same coin when you're teaching english language of course half of our texts that we present to our learners for writers effects or description or even for annotating a particular sample text we pick up so many texts from english literature teachers of english have been widely teaching and of course famously teaching william shakespeare's works you you take up william shakespeare's work there are so many critical uh, uh, reviews on william shakespeare's characters they have been exactly. touted as homosexual they have been touted as uh, gays as well they have been yeah. lesbian characters when they are or they are gay characters when they are switching the character you talk about uh, the critical uh, uh, the, the critics for merchant of venice they have already talked about uh, antonio and bassanio being gay characters there has been so much of conjecture about that so why not the learners need to be you know updated about these things you cannot fight shy you cannot the more you create a barrier i think the more you are putting that kind of you know suspense and you are trying to push the learners or push the society towards tasting the forbidden fruit and committing things which they are not supposed to be committing exactly exactly so uh, uh, with that note uh, i'd like to thank uh, all of you for being here with us and also mr abhinandan for uh, sharing his wonderful insights and also the great research that uh, uh, happened uh, behind this wonderful webinar and uh, to all of you again stay safe and also stay uh i mean stay safe and stay healthy Absolutely. and also uh, wish you all a happy uh, sports day uh, that we are expecting uh, that uh, we are awaiting on the saturday this week and i so wish all so the a happy teachers day in advance happy teachers day which is on the 5th so i request all of you to keep following us on our facebook uh, for uh, exciting events and also uh, activities thank you so much and wish you all a happy weekend that happens from day after tomorrow thank you thank you so much